It's my pleasure now to introduce Melanie Welfare. Melanie was born in Auckland and spent many years in the United Kingdom. Her career in health began at the age of 17 as a nursing auxiliary, then as a nurse in the Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps. That's the nursing branch of the British Army Medical Services. She completed midwifery education at Bournemouth University in the late 1990s, spent 14 years as a core continuity and lead care midwife, returning to New Zealand in 2000. In 2010, she moved into academics part-time while working for the New Zealand College of Midwives. She now lives in Perth, Australia, and teaches at Edith Cowan University. Melanie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Just let me know when you're ready for me to move slides. Brilliant. Thank you, Cecilia. I'll have slide one up. That's fine. That's just beautiful. Um, thank you for attending this session today and for the, my warm welcome by Cecilia. Before I begin my presentation and open for discussion, I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Nungabuja, the traditional custodians of the land, in which I work and live. I recognize their continued connection to the land and waters of this beautiful place and acknowledge that they never ceded sovereignty. As a midwife, I also acknowledge the deep hurt and damage that has resulted from suppression of traditional birthing knowledge and practice. I pay my respect to the elders, past, present and emerging, and for the for they hold the memories, traditions and cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the land. So at the moment, we all know that midwifery is a tough profession to be in. There's an ever increasing body of knowledge scrutinizing the issues of retaining midwives in the workforce, with several national and international studies highlighting midwifery burnout, exacerbated by increased workload, bullying, and financial constraints. This results in understaffing and poor skill mix in the workplace. I wonder people are choosing to leave or work part-time. Alongside this, we now know that many women's birthing journeys are becoming more complex. Midwives are now working with more women who have clinical, psychological, and social complexities. More labors are being induced, and the cesarean section rate continues to increase. And at the moment in Western Australia, the government figures show that the cesarean section rate was 43% for the last quarter of 2023. When you add in things like poverty, injustice, pandemics, climate change, past and present government legislation that is harmful to women and midwives of many countries across the world, and I'm especially thinking of our women and our midwifery sisters that are surviving in places of civil unrest and war zones at the moment. I think you would all agree with me that being a midwife is a tough job. Despite this, many men midwives enter the profession with a dream of an, an internalized vision of the midwife they want to be, how they will work with women, families and other healthcare professionals. This vision becomes part of and adds to their midwifery identity, identity as they grow and mature as a midwife. There's often, though, a dichotomy between the midwife you want to be and this increasingly challenging climate of midwifery, as I've outlined above. This can lead to midwives having to consider how they re remain personally and professionally sustainable within the workforce. Next slide, please. This discussion focuses on the themes of qualitative research conducted in the South Island of New Zealand. A series of one-to-one -one interviews took place with employed and self-employed midwives who worked across the full scope of midwife and have moved from one work setting to another within the last two years. I'll use the midwives' words to illustrate the themes and sub-themes. Names have been changed to maintain confidentiality. As it was part of my master's thesis, I'd also like to thank Professor Robin Maud of Victoria University of Wellington, who was my supervisor at the time 
for all of her support and obviously for the midwives who gave up their time to be interviewed. This project had ethical approval and was conducted pre-pandemic and Nolf and Webster's thematic analysis was undertaken to develop the themes and sub-themes. Slide three, please. There were four main themes within the whole project. In brief, these were movement happens that midwives move and change their professions as they move around their careers, that they'll start in one place, they'll end up in another, that they'll go from working on the ward to working um, in the community, to education, to, um, to things like quality or um, into education itself that midwives really value support, that they need support to be able to stay in this profession. And that support can be from a range of places. So family, friends, midwifery colleagues, other healthcare professionals. Another main theme was that things have changed. So um, the midwives that I spoke to when we were talking about these, um, doing this research, they were talking about how things have changed while they've been in the profession. And the big thing that they talked about was the use of social media and the use of um, texting as a form of communication and how that impacts on how they work with the women. And if I have time, I can go back and expand on these themes. The main thing, the thing that I want to talk about is this notion of being an ideal midwife. So the rest of this presentation will focus on what the midwives felt made them an ideal midwife, the guilt and stress that arose when they were unable to maintain their own internalized midwifery identity, identity and the steps that they took to remain personally and professional professionally sustainable in, the, in midwifery. Slide four, please. The midwives interview had a clear vision of what made them an ideal midwife. They had a clear midwifery identity, identity and philosophy. They could articulate the type of midwife they wanted to be within the workforce, regardless of their working environment. They felt that an ideal midwife was always being the best possible midwife that they could be, despite of and within the constraints of their chosen way of working. All of the midwives interviewed talked about wanting to do the best job possible. They talked about being autonomous, being a perfectionist, having integrity, being determined, satisfied, and getting enjoyment from their roles within midwifery. When I was talking to these midwives, they talked about their phil personal philosophies of midwifery adding to the picture of them knowing what sort of midwife they wanted to be. These midwives said that the ideal midwife should always have total commitment to, and that the women that they work with should always be the center of the care they provided. And this links into plenty of work done by several researchers which recognize that we've got a number of protective factors which increase job satisfaction and improve workforce retention. And these are having professional identity and recognition of that, having pride in the profession, practicing autonomously, having good working conditions, and lastly, the ability to form meaningful relationships with women and to be able to make a difference in their lives. And, um, you know, as I say, this, this, this research is, um, there's quite a bit now, and I was just looking at stuff from back in 2007, right up into 2017 that had been looking at this. Slide five, please. Within the theme of an ideal midwife, four sub-themes were identified. And the first one that I will discuss is this notion again of what midwifery identify identity is. So if I go back to the very beginning, where does this midwifery identity come from? I was trying to work out when it starts to form. And I decided that it comes from student to expert. So that identity that we form as midwives and who we're going to be starts to form even before 
um, people move into an education program. It's this nascent desire to support women in their childbearing journeys that brings people to the professions. So I could, I've been in education, as Cecilia said, for quite a while now, but midwifery students can really articulate their emerging philosophies within the first weeks of a program. And um, when I worked in Aotearoa, New Zealand, one of the first things we got the students to do was actually think about what their philosophies were going to be. And this, obviously, it changes as the students move through their midwifery program. This midwifery identity changes as they're exposed to a variety of learning, clinical situations, the women they work alongside. They also will bring along with them their own life experience, which all add into this who they are, what their midwifery identity is going to be. Once students have taken on the role of a midwife, it appears to define them, their midwifery identity defines them as a person. And Debbie said, I saw myself being a midwife forever. I was so happy in the job. I loved it. I will be a midwife till I'm 75. A midwife who has recently stopped working as a self-employed midwife continues to describe herself as a midwife first. For 26 years of my life, I was a midwife. I know it's a job, but it almost becomes part of your makeup. You are a mother, a wife, a woman, but you are also a midwife. Others talked about being passionate about midwifery and always wanting to be a midwife, loving being a midwife, not giving up midwifery. And in the current climate of midwifery, it's heart, it was heartening to hear that nearly all of the midwives in interviewed describe themselves as midwives first and foremost, appearing to have pride in the profession themselves and their role within it. It was expressed in a variety of ways. Philippa said, I saw myself being a midwife forever, not a midwife in the general broad sense, but a midwife as I was. I saw myself doing this forever. I was so happy in the job. I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved it. Although, as stated pre previously, midwives generally saw themselves in a positive light, at times they also talked about much more negative emotions, being disengaged, being burnt out, sadness, scared, lonely, and even becoming unpleasant. And these more negative emotions became much more frequently used when midwives were discussing, discussing factors leading them up to transitioning work settings. So moving from being employed to self-employed, and I'll come to back, back to that a, a little bit later on and explain more about it. Next slide, please. The second sub theme, and it was one that came across really, really um, strongly, was women at the centre of the picture. This theme of the woman being the centre of care continued throughout the interviews with statements which indicated that the ideal midwife placed the woman in paramountcy in the following ways. Doing what the woman needed, taking care of the women, women needing support. Everything upmost is done for your woman love working with families. The essence is working with them in a meaningful and satisfying way. Anne called herself an idealist and discussed how she, she tries to stay true to her mis midwifery identity of providing woman-centered care, but that the environment around her makes this challenging at times. She states that the essence of midwifery is working with women in a meaningful and satisfying way. Anne and Sue liked the autonomy to work with women in their own way, enjoyed supporting women, and that they loved the midwifery. Debbie agreed when she says that she loved the journey of the woman who became a mum. I do this job because I really love midwifery and love working with the families. Next slide, please. Whereas Rachel and Sean and Andrea discussed 
the same thing, but from a viewpoint of an employed midwife, stating that when they were working with women, that the woman still needed midwifing, even if their self-employed midwife was not available. And Andrea, who says that she tries to preserve some of the woman's wishes in a hospital setting by keeping the things she can normal for that family. And this, um, when we're looking at the um, employed midwives who mainly worked in, in a hospital setting, they found that, um, that they were able to form these relationships with the women very, very quickly because they didn't have as much time with them. But these relationships were still as important to them as a self-employed midwife who worked with the women over their, content, over their pregnancy, content, continuity of their pregnancy. Um, and for them, for the, many of the participants interviewed, they discussed this relationship with the woman they worked on, either as self-employed or employed, was one of the most important things to them. And that, that when they move work settings or they transition or considering leaving the profession, this is the thing that leaves them with sadness and makes them feel sorrowful that they are no longer able to continue. Next slide, please. So in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the midwifery model of care is unique in the fact that midwives can move from one workplace setting to another easily, from employed to self-employed and vice versa. Um, and this, I think there's many reasons for this. Um, one is we're, a, we're very, New Zealand's a very small country and this research was carried out in New Zealand. And that um, often that midwives are supporting each other to move in and out of these settings. So this transitioning work settings is a way that midwives remain personally sustainable by ensuring their own health and well-being and professionally sustainable by ensuring that they've got durability and longevity within the profession. And um, We'll come back to it again, but this, um, this ability, as I say, to move from um, self-employed to employed, what usually happens is if you're employed, the midwives will start dropping down the amount of hours they do while they're building up a caseload. And if they are um, a self-employed midwife that want to move into an employed setting, they need to let their caseload run down. So they've still got some, some money coming in. And then they will transition into picking up shifts and eventually into full-time or part-time employment, whatever they, they need. Guilt and stress was another sub-theme that we saw and the midwives discussed both internal and en external factors which impacted on their working lives and ultimately led to this transition to a uh, dis decision to transition. And regardless of whatever practice setting they were working in, they felt they were being pulled in different directions. That this tug of war between their personal midwifery identity and what made them this ideal um, midwife and their philosophies, their family and work environments manifested itself in very different ways. And throughout the analysis, it showed that guilt and the subsequent increase in stress appeared to be a compounding factor for midwives prior to transitioning workplaces. Midwives discussed the impact this had on them throughout the interviews when asked what were the factors that influenced you wanting to transition and answered. So for me, the main thing has been a tug of war between two parts. One is my midwifery identity and the work I find rewarding, makes my heart sing and the demands it has on my family. Then I find the demands of being on call really difficult with young children. So after a period of time, I become really tired of that and I transition back again. I think this really illustrates the point that this is a normal part of the midwifery 
um, profession in New Zealand that actually midwives use this to remit, to be sustainable within the profession. Debbie also discussed the dichotomy between work and family commitments when she stated, on my son's birthday, I was down here at the hospital with a laboring woman for a labor and birth, and we and I was unable to go. We were eventually caught up with him, but on that important day, I was not there. So when talking with the midwives, they felt privileged to be a midwife, but it could be said that when the demands of the job, the guilt and the stress that arose, that led to these negative thoughts around the partner, working in partnership with women. And it melt, meant that they internalized and they started to feel that they were no longer an ideal midwife. So when these stresses start to, um, midwives start to feel these stresses, they lose this idea and move away from what they think this ideal, their picture of what this ideal midwife should be. Next slide, please. Some midwives felt this was a, a failure when they had chosen, when they left their education programs to work either as an employed midwife or a self-employed midwife. And when it did clash with their identity and what they thought it, it was to be an ideal midwife, this again caused that friction between what they believed and what they could do. Debbie discussed the decision to move from self-employed practice to an employed setting as a very emotional experience for her. I didn't want to transition. I just couldn't do it anymore. It was really traumatic for me. I just couldn't do it anymore. I had to stop. And she goes on to say it was pretty messy. Philippa states clearly that if she hadn't transitioned work settings at the time that she did, that she would no longer be working as a midwife. This shows that sustainability and protective factor that it has. However, Rachel, who recently left the workforce, talked about the point that she had gotten to when she knew she could no longer work as a midwife in any setting. I just got up one day and just couldn't do it anymore. And I have never done any midwifery since that day. However, this was not an easy decision. As she goes on to say, I felt that I had let everybody down. I felt that the women were relying on me, that they had chosen me to be their midwife. I felt that I'd left them down, left them in the lurch. It was probably a good six months before I stopped feeling incredibly guilty. It made me incredibly anxious about what they would think of me. Shan explained that she felt guilty and emotional for wanting to tran trans transition work settings because she did not want the women to feel a sense of guilt that she needed to move jobs because the nature of the job that she was in meant that I had to be on call and that I had to get up and go for the birth, and that some women would see that her moving and transition, transitioning a work setting was because of the nature of the way that she was working with them as a self-employed midwife. Similar thoughts were expressed by Anne, who talked about how she'd signed up to work with the woman as a self-employed midwife, and that she understood the commitment that she had made for the, made to them for the duration of the pregnancy. Some of the midwives discussed the impact the process had on their practice partners when transitioning from being a self-employed to employed midwife. Knowing that, yeah, I'd left her by herself, it was going to be tough on her. Another talked about leaving her in the lurch, but she had a desperation to finish. Looking at transitioning the other way from an employed to a self-employed role, one midwife said that she was sad to be letting go. And particularly the doctors and the junior doctors were like, you can't go, meaning that they would actually miss her knowledge and her expertise of when she was working in that ward setting. But an understanding of this transition from other midwives, both in employed and in the um, community settings. And from the interviewed, 
They supported the midwives as they moved between these two settings. Andrew and Chris discussed the, the support they got from employed midwives when, we the, when they were um, going in suddenly as a self-employed midwife and how that role had changed. And identifies that when she moved from being an employed midwife to being self-employed, it was her practice partner who gave her the support that she needed and the teaching of the ways of being um, out there in um, working as a self-employed midwife. Because although both settings are midwives, they've got subtle differences. But the, uh, overall, they felt it was um, very sad for all people involved when midwives had to move. Debbie talked about her ex-practice partners who ceased working with her during the last few years. She's clearly supportive of their decision to leave the partnership, but goes on to say that you grieve for that practice partner and the professional friendship that's been lost. A couple of participants describe their experiences of working with less experience on new members of staff and how this increases stress levels, especially when working as an employed midwife. Rachel discusses how difficult it is work to work with inexperienced junior doctors and finding when we had a new intake of doctors, junior doctors don't make decisions based on experience. They are unsupported at night. And that if you weren't happy with the CTG, and just the stress of having to deal with their lack of knowledge. So she's ex expressing that actually that regardless of the setting, the stress starts to build um, despite what is going on. Next slide, please. The last sub-theme was effects on physical and mental well-being. All of the midwives who were interviewed discuss the physical manifestations of stress when working in both either employed or the self-employed role and how before they transitioned work settings these became one of the factors that really influenced their decision to leave or to transition practice as a way of trying to remain in the profession and if we think about midwifery Many of um, midwives that, that work in the profession are often the sole earners for um, for their families. That they, you know, that many families now need two um, two employed people to manage, you know, the the cost of living crisis that we're going through on a national and global level. So that they. Um, they really start to build the stress and be start to worry about it as they um, are thinking about leaving the profession. They also talked about grief, a grief process that went along with this decision making. Worryingly, some of the more negative phrases that could be construed in a way to show that the majority of these midwives had actually really nearly reached burnout and they had very negative thoughts about themselves and their role within the profession. Some of these were, midwifery came very close to finishing me. It completely broke me. Some felt that they'd gone nuts, or even if they continued, I'm not going to be here. I can't do it anymore. And this led to that these feelings have been disenchanted and disenfranchised. Rachel states that she hid this from her family, that she, was unable, that she was unable to function as a midwife. I don't think they realized how unwell I was becoming. I would often say that I wasn't busy when I stayed at home. One of the midwives interviewed also talked about being scared for the woman when she was discussing the manifestations of her feelings and thoughts because she knew that she was not doing the best job that she possibly could. This group of midwives went on to talk about how they were trying to manage these issues and for some that their coping mechanisms were disengaging from the profession or possibly not staying in midwifery. One midwife summed this up by saying that sometimes we need to remember that we are still people. When talking about the actual 
process of transitioning work settings, a number of the midwives interviewed talked about how this affected their physical health and said prior to transitioning, that she was feeling really tired, flat and down, burnt out and that she had become a little bit unpleasant. She suffered with insomnia on a regular basis. She understood that where she was working was not good for her health, but because of the emotional stress, she was unable to make a decision. Next slide, please. This again shows that dissonance between your views of what an ideal midwife should be and being an employed midwife. Um, they talked about midwives talked about working in the hospital session setting and that clash between their identity and personal philosophies often differ, differs from that of a corporate environment. Both Debbie and Maggie talked about being just another person in the system and later on in the conversation about not feeling valued or safe. Or Sean, who says, I think the I think that it's the whole thing of being part of a big institution. You can't change anything. You have to live with the stupid red tape and the rules and the things. It just actually affects your ability to provide care. She had actually got to the point where she needed to seek professional support to help her make the decision to move away from midwifery for a period of time to maintain a good life-work balance. And although she went on to disengage from the profession for nearly a year, she felt sadness for letting go a way of work in which she had previously enjoyed and returned after that year. Sue always talks, talked about sustainability within the profession. And although she endeavored to maintain a good work-life balance, acknowledged that it got stressful and she finds that she had a tension going on. Um, Andrew says the cost to her was physical, mental and financial. And this could manifest, manifest itself as anger. People said, I hated being on call. When the phone goes off, you want to throw it against the wall. You know you have finished when you cry before you go on shift. And they, how they had all thought theoretically that they had make, made all the right moves to be sustainable, taking regular time off to be with our families. Essentially, everything they thought that should sustain practice, it didn't keep them going. Chris talked about being on shifts when she felt that her body clock was all over the place. She indicated that transitioning from early, late and night shifts all within one week impacted her physically and that they find shift work challenging. Midwives who were self-employed just prior to transitioning all talked about sleep deprivation. I was just exhausted getting into bed every night with the fear that I would not be able to sustain there. Um, one midwife talked about the impact it had on her intimate relationship with her partner. My sleep pattern was severely affected because you had to sleep just in case. So I was sleeping at any time of the day or night. A number, the following quote, which will be used to sum up this section, says that midwives, that women are entitled to the every bit of care they receive from me, even though I feel that at times it was a really shitty thing that I had to provide care in the way that which I had to provide it. But it wasn't their fault. It wasn't my fault. We're just two women struck in this crazy system that forces us to work in such an insane way at times. Sometimes it can be beautiful but sometimes it's crazy and dangerous. Next slide, think, please. The findings suggested that, by, that there's, when there's a dissonance between your midwifery identity and not being able to provide the level of care women require, it can be detrimental to midwife, and it is given as a reason of transitioning work settings or unfortunately leaving the profession. This has been identified in other research is, um, across the years and in 2011 back in 2011 a study from New Zealand stated that paradoxically it is the drive to offer woman-centered excellent midwifery care that can undo the well-being of the midwife and back in 2006 in the NHS the seminal work about why do midwives leave it's because they're unable to 
be the sort of midwife they wished to be. They were unable to form the meaningful relationships with midwife and they were unable to provide quality care while working within the constraints of the hospital midwives. Midwives who are constantly conflicted when their allegiances are divided between the woman they're working with themselves, families, employers and practice partners can eventually lead to a sense of moral injury. And moral injury is where a person's strong held moral values, beliefs and philosophies are in conflict with the job they do. And it's managed in other professions by changing workplaces, cutting hours or leaving the workforce. And in 2018, Talbot and Dean stated moral injury may be driving the healthcare ecosystem to a tipping point and causing a collapse of resilience amongst the worst workforce. The midwives I spoke to gave us some lovely pointers for remaining sustainable within the profession. They need support from a range of people, their colleagues, their family and friends, practice partners, women, mentors, and other healthcare professions. They could not work in isolation. Collegial support was a strong factor that fed into job satisfaction. It's the nurturing of these relationships that leads to personal and professional sustainability. And Andrea Gilkinson said that um, in 2017, and that increasing trust and knowledge sharing between practitioners ultimately result in the increased safety of mother and baby. So self-care is important, regular time off, planning holidays, dropping the number of hours in employment, taking annual leave and managing the number of women in caseloads. Physical self-care was also important, exercise, eating, sleeping well, disconnecting from devices, which is getting harder and harder and maintaining boundaries with colleagues and women. So um, as I said before, texting has become a really strong factor in this. Um, but um, and the women contacting midwives at all days, but also from an employed setting, the texts that go out going, we need some more staff is actually crossing those boundaries and increases stress. So to sum up this profession, this is a profession that mid many midwives enter with the notion of what is an ideal midwife, that many work hard to ensure that they work with women in a meaningful way and that the stresses of life, family, work environment can sometimes impact on how, how midwives work. But by being supportive and maintaining a good work-life balance will help help maintain professional and personal sustainability.